Today on Blue 58, the Packers don't have a need at tight end per se, but they also don't not have a need. Double negatives aside, the Packers would probably be wise to take a look at tight ends, so why don't we do the same? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. And I'm especially excited about this episode because it is the time of the draft process when we get to talk about objectively the best position in football, which is tight end. Now, I may be a little bit biased, being that I spent most of the time that I spent playing organized football at the tight end position. But tongue-in-cheek references aside, I think it is a really interesting spot. You get to do a lot of interesting things at at tight end, and a good tight end unlocks a lot of different things for your offense. Or, if you don't have one guy, you can fill that position with a bunch of different guys who do different things very well, or varying degrees of well, and you can kind of pass off a reasonable facsimile of having just one really good guy. And that is kind of where the Packers find themselves. They've got four tight ends that they use pretty regularly, but they all do very different things. Two of them, I guess, do fairly similar things. We'll talk about them in a second. But the the big names, of course, that you have to be aware about are Mercedes Lewis and Robert Tunyon. Lewis is the classic inline tight end, often referred to as the Y tight end. Lining up at one end of your, your offensive line, typically the strong side of your formation, hand on the ground. He's going to block first and catch passes passes second. Robert Tunyon is almost exactly the opposite. He is smaller, faster, fingers crossed, post-ACL surgery. And he's more of the guy who's going to move around and catch, catch passes. Might line up near Lewis, might line up on the weak side of the formation, might stand up in the slot, a little bit of everything. But he's going to use his athleticism to get open and and get down the field. Then the Packers have their F tight ends, which are basically fullbacks, sometimes called H-backs. But they're guys that will line up in the backfield as an H-back, hand on the ground, do fullback stuff, hand on the ground at the end of the line doing tight end stuff. That's Josiah DeGuara and Dominique Daphne. Thicker guys, but still fairly athletic. So what do the Packers need at tight end? Given that group of players, the answer, honestly, is nothing really, at least not in the short term. But if you go and refer back to our overall draft philosophy, I think tight end is going to be a priority backfill position for the Packers because they've got questions at all three of those roles. First, how much longer does Mercedes Lewis want to keep playing? If he continues to block well, he can play until he's 50. But how much longer does he really want to do it? There's a shelf life on every NFL career, and a lot of times that shelf life has to do with just want to. How long do you want to keep slamming your body into another human being 17 times a year at minimum? Well, 17 days a year at minimum, plus practices, plus postseason games. You get it. It's a demanding sport. How long does Mercedes Lewis want to do it? If the answer is one more year, the Packers are going to need to replace a lot of blocking at tight end relatively quickly. But the questions don't end there. What if Robert Tunyon doesn't come all the way back from his ACL injury? Or what if it takes him a year or a year and a half to get all the way back from his knee injury? Well, then the Packers have a short-term need at tight end. But they're going to need some reinforcements beyond Tunyon regardless, because other than Tunyon, they don't really have a pass-catching tight end on the roster right now. And then as far as DeGuara and Daphne go, they play pretty small roles. That's why it was always kind of odd that the Packers spent the third-round pick on Josiah DeGuara, even if you're a big fan of him and what he can do, and I am probably in that camp. I'm a reasonably big Josiah DeGuara fan. There just isn't a lot for him to do. It's a pretty small role. He's a complimentary tight end in the best of times. The Packers need more out of that position. And even if Robert Tunyon is healthy this year and can go from week one, and I I don't think there's anybody who reasonably expects him to do that, the Packers are going to need more out of that position in the relatively near future. So they need somebody who can contribute. So how do you find a good one? My methodology for finding a good tight end is going to be very similar to 
what we used on wide receivers. In fact, it's exactly the same. We're going to use uh, the great Paul Noonan's wide receiver OPS plus relative athletic score, so wraps, to find pass-catching tight ends. Why focus exclusively on pass-catching tight ends? First, as much as I like the versatility of a tight end, they're never going to be your best blocker. And the value they provide as a blocker, I think, is still pretty much always going to pale in comparison to what they can do for you as a pass catcher. So I think you should look for pass catchers first and foremost, just because it's a more valuable skill. But secondly, and probably more importantly, the odds of getting a tight end who is a very good or even relatively competent blocker right out of the gate as a rookie are very low. It's a skill that takes some time to learn at the NFL. It's a take, it takes some time to excel at it at the NFL level. I think the, the physical development aspect of playing in the NFL is an under-discussed phenomenon is probably not the right word, but it's an under-discussed aspect of playing a lot of the positions that require a lot of physical contact. So offensive line, defensive line, and tight end kind of gets grouped in there too. Maybe inside linebacker too, less so because you're, you're having less, I think, direct physical contact. But there is a learning curve. Old man strength, I guess, gets referred to kind of in a joking manner a lot of times, but there's something to it. There's something to the idea of developing your body to be able to ha handle blocking against other NFL caliber bodies. And guys that are 26, 27, 28 are just physically different in a lot of ways than guys that are 21, 22, 23, 24. It takes some time to become that kind of a player. I wager that even as good a blocker as he is now, if you went back to when he was a rookie and first two, three years in the league, Mercedes Lewis wouldn't be the same player. It just takes time. And it takes, again, some physical development. So if you're looking for blocking as a primary skill set in your tight ends, I think you're probably going to be disappointed. Along those lines, I just don't know if there's a good way to objectively measure blocking ability in a way that we can talk about it meaningfully and project it to the NFL level. So I've come around a lot on what Pro Football Focus does. I think there is some value in what they do. I think they're always going to be more valuable in terms of their stats than in terms of their grades. But let's say, for instance, that we want to look at at a player's grades as a blocker in, in college and try to protect project that to the NFL. First, I don't think there's a lot of college tight ends that are blocking meaningfully enough to get grades that are really going to matter. Secondly, you think physical attributes matter a lot for things like wide receivers and running backs. Think about the physical differences between a dominant blocking tight end at the college level and a guy who isn't. Like, why would a guy be dominant blocking at the college level? Well, chances are he's just bigger than everyone else. And that's not something you're ever really going to be able to count on at the NFL level. So even if he's grading out well, how much value is there to that to that grade. Thirdly, blocking college guys and blocking NFL stuff is just so different. I don't know how valuable it is to really project that to the NFL. It's kind of like, in a lot of ways, the contested catch stuff that we were talking about with receivers. Sure, it's great that you can physically dominate guys that are not your physical equal and make these amazing contested catches or catches in coverage or whatever at the college level. But if you're having to work that hard at the college level to get open, that you, you have to make all these contested catches, are you, are you really ready for NFL football anyway? Along those same lines, if you are a college tight end who is physically dominant enough to be a, a good blocker to the point that all they have you do is blocking, enough that we can get a meaningful idea of what you're, what you're capable of in college, I mean, doesn't that say you're kind of a limited player already? If you're really physically dominant, wouldn't they have you split out and catching passes more? Even a guy who we're going to talk about, like Jelani Woods, who is considered a pretty good blocker at the college level, in part because he's enormous, I mean, he still put up big numbers catching the ball. A lot of guys that are just blockers, but fairly athletic still, are, end up getting moved to tackle anyway. 
fairly early in their college career most of the time. Uh, J.C. Treader, former Packers center and guard and uh, occasional tackle, is a good example of that. He was a good blocker in college, was athletic fairly for a tight end, but they could tell that his future wasn't going to be in catching passes. So they moved him to tackle, and the rest is history. The Packers took him, they moved him to guard and center, and you know the story from there. Chances are you're going to be on the offensive line anyway if you're a good enough blocker to stand out as a blocker in the college level. So that brings us to this year's class. It's not great at tight end. Using the methodology or whatever, um, the, the rubric we have, there are only three guys that fall into the Tier 1 class, guys that are productive and athletic. We'll talk about who they are in a second, but m- overall in the class, there are a lot of athletes, but not a lot of productive players. And I think while that's disappointing from a tight end enthusiast perspective, that may actually be a strength for the Packers. If you're looking for developmental prospects, and I think that's probably where the Packers are going to end up, you don't need necessarily an immediate contributor, but maybe a guy who can contribute in 2023 or beyond, getting a prospect with some athletic upside might be the way to go. And there's a lot of good athletes in this class. There's a lot of good, big guys in this class who, who are at least reasonably athletic for their size. Where you end up drafting them is virtually a complete mystery to me because I don't know what to make of a lot of the tight ends in this class, and I think that's why we have a list that is so short of of the Tier 1 guys. And even the Tier 1 guys, I don't think you're seeing a a day one talent out of any of these. You don't see a first-round pick in the guys that we're going to talk about. I would honestly be surprised if there is a first-round pick at tight end this year. That's not to say there aren't some good guys out there. That's not to say there there aren't some useful players in this class, but there's no, like, TJ Hawkinson, who's a real conversation to, to be in the top 10 of the draft. Doesn't seem that way, at least. So our guys, there are three. We're just going to talk about them in order of, I think, fun this time. Usually we go alphabetical by last name, but we're going to talk about them in the order of the relative funness that they are as a player. And the first one, the most fun one, the guy who might be my draft crush in the entire class this year, is Jelani Woods out of Virginia. Six feet, seven inches tall, 259 pounds, and a relative athletic score of 10. A perfect 10 for our friend Jelani Woods. Just wild numbers from the big man. 4.6140 yard dash, 37 and a half inch vertical, 10 feet and change in the broad jump and pretty good agility numbers for a guy who is about the size of an aircraft carrier. How did he get to this point, though? Why haven't we really heard about Jelani Woods prior to this year? Well, he had three pretty nondescript seasons at Oklahoma State after starting out there actually as a quarterback and switching to something that they call the cowboy back position. But then he switches to Virginia for his final college season and puts up 44 catches for 598 yards and eight touchdowns. And suddenly people are starting to notice the enormous guy running down the field in Virginia. Numerous scouting reports that I've read about Jelani Woods describe his play style as that of a guy who looks like an angry moose. And I have to tell you, it's that line that, that just sold me. I just don't know how you do much better than a guy who is described as an angry moose. What to like? Size and production. I mean, it's all there. Big guy who produces at a pretty high level, who is at least a decent enough blocker that people mention it. A lot to like there. But still, he seems pretty raw. And you wonder if he's a one-year wonder or just an athlete or even just what is he at all. You don't get a lot of real opportunities to talk about a guy who's this athletic at this size, who kind of just came out of nowhere. It's almost like a mythical sort of sort of creature situation. What do you do with that guy? He doesn't seem like the, the Jimmy Graham basketball type. He's not going to be a big stats guy in the NFL, it doesn't seem. But he's so unique physically that you can't help but be intrigued. 
He does obviously remind me of Mercedes Lewis. Everybody says this about him, but it's true. Even Dane Brugler writes in The Beast, which if you're a member of The Athletic, you should definitely check out. He writes of Woods, quote, a prototypical wide tight end at the next level. He caters his game after Mercedes Lewis, and it shows, end quote. I mean, I like Mercedes as much as the next guy. Sign me up for another one of those. Probably a day two, day three pick. If the Packers could get him in the third round, I would be all about that. Our next contestant is Greg Dulcich out of UCLA. Six foot four, 243 pounds, a relative athletic score of 8.2. Final stat, or fi- relevant stats are, are pretty good over his final two college years. He put up 42 catches for 725 yards and five touchdowns in his final college season, had 26 catches for 517 yards and five touchdowns in 2020. Yards per catch is wide receiver type stuff. 18, 19 yards per catch. He can get down the field. Certainly very productive. I wish he was a little bit faster, but still fairly athletic for his size. Still in that elite athlete category by relative athletic score. I don't like that he's a little bit undersized, and that's strange to say about a guy who's six foot four and 243 pounds, but that's just the way that football works. He's probably going to end up more in that H-back type role. Maybe not quite as exclusively as a guy like Josiah DeGuara, though DeGuara is even still a little bit heavier than Dulcich is, he does seem to fill that Deguara type vein. Not quite the light receiver type that uh, Robert Tunyon is, but he does sort of fall into that category too of being a receiving type tight end and probably looking at the purest receiver of the three that we're looking at. He certainly doesn't have the size to be even an accidental blocker like Woods is. But, and incidentally, that is something we should talk about. I think a lot of guys that are described as good blockers at tight end in college are almost accidentally so. I mean, how could you help but be a good blocker if you're a guy like Jelani Woods? If you're six foot seven and 259 pounds, if nothing else, it's going to take a guy a while to run around you and get to where he's trying to go. You might just accidentally be a good blocker uh, just because of your size. I don't think that's quite the case with Woods, but it's at least worth mentioning, uh, given that I think that it does apply to a few tight ends over time. Dulcich doesn't have that concern, though. We don't have to worry about whether he's accidentally a good blocker or not. Good enough, uh, but not probably his primary role, uh, given the athleticism numbers. Finally, uh, the the final tier one guy is going to be a, a day three pick, maybe even undrafted free agent, but he is one of the most productive guys in the class uh, in terms of receiving numbers. Uh, the six foot eight inch Austin Allen out of Nebraska, six eight, two hundred fifty three pounds, eight point oh three relative athletic score, thirty eight catches for six hundred two yards and two touchdowns his final season as a Corn Husker. You like athletic projects? Austin Allen is an athletic project. But athleticism at six foot eight is fairly rare. Even Jelani Woods, not quite six foot eight. He's not a blocker by any stretch, though he does line up as a traditional wide tight end quite frequently. But he is he has virtually no play strength or testing strength at all. And I say that as a guy who can't bench two hundred and twenty five pounds, but he could only put it up eight times on the on the bench, which is which is not great pretty much for any position in the NFL, maybe defensive back or kicker. You're not asking for for eight reps or much more than eight reps there, but uh, eight for a tight end is, uh, well, not a red flag, sure, but um, maybe it is a red flag. It's not great by any stretch of the imagination. He reminds me a little bit of Jimmy Graham in that he is just a tall receiver. He does not have the athleticism, the the vertical athleticism that Graham had, uh, but he does... Well, think back to how Jimmy Graham played in 2018. Even if he couldn't get his big old self off the ground like he he used to, he could still run fairly well once he built up a head of steam. A long strider, uh, but fairly effective on drag or crossing routes still. Uh, he, he could do some decent things after the catch. Allen is kind of in that vein, and he's got the physical attributes that make you wonder if he ever figures it out what kind of player he could be. And that, I think, is the kind of player the Packers should be at least nominally interested in. 
They need to build some depth at tight end. They need a contributor for next season. Well, next season, meaning 2023, not this coming season. Though I, I guess you could call that next season at this point. It doesn't really matter. Um, they need a guy who's going to grow a little bit. So if not Austin Allen specifically, maybe one of the other guys in this class who put up good testing numbers but maybe weren't necessarily all that productive in college and uh, want to see what they can do. This is a situation where I think the Packers are almost obligated, if they want to draft a tight end, to take traits over production. Because as we can see, the guys among the most productive receivers still have some significant questions about them. Is Austin Allen even an NFL player? Is um, Greg Dulcich going to be limited by his, his NFL role? What even is Jelani Woods? Still, guys like them are probably worth investing in just because the upside is there. Each of these is fairly athletic. And even if other prospects throughout the class aren't as productive as these guys were, finding someone who can grow, who has room to grow, is probably what the Packers need at tight end in this draft class. Those are my tight end thoughts. would love to hear what you think. Uh, find us anywhere that we exist on the internet or by email at thepowersweep1959 at gmail.com. That's probably something I should mention more often. So consider it mentioned. In the meantime, that is all I've got for you in this episode. I appreciate you tuning in. I'd appreciate it even more if you would take a second to share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. That's going to help more people find the show and in turn get more people involved in this conversation that you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 50.